Welcome everyone to the second edition, second episode of my relaunch of my Thinking Biblically podcast, which is now available on both YouTube and uh, audio only through your favorite podcast provider. Uh, last week, I was with my son Daniel and we explored uh, the topic of what is Thinking Biblically. And if you missed that, the link is going to be in the description so you can check that out. Looking forward to uh, the wide variety of guests that are planned over the next few weeks and i'll be mentioning who's coming on uh, next week uh, at the end of, of this conversation uh, but uh, today i have with me dr david friedman uh, david was raised in minnesota and currently lives uh, near jerusalem he is the former academic dean and professor of jewish studies at king of kings college in jerusalem Currently, uh, he lectures internationally on biblical topics as well as on the history of the modern state of Israel. He's a former member of the Israeli Defense Forces, as a lot of Israelis are. He also works actively in the area of Jewish-Arab reconciliation as a speaker and mentor and is an advocate for a secure state of Israel. He also serves as the secretary of the Israeli political party Gush HaTanahi, which means the Bible bloc. Maybe we'll hear a little bit about that after. David is the writer of several books, uh, including, and all these are available on Amazon. They loved the Torah, what Yeshua's first followers really thought about the law. Sudden Terror, Exposing Militant Islam's War Against the United States and Israel. At the Feet of Rabbi Gamaliel, Rabbinic Influence in Paul's Teachings. And Shemot, a translation and commentary to the book of Exodus. David is currently working on a new book, providing a summary of the recent rocket attacks, which is what we're going to be talking about in a couple of minutes. But first, I'd like to mention how we met. And so um, I was actually the Bible chapel, Bible, the baseball chapel leader of a professional baseball team here in Ottawa, where I live. Uh, that was a few years ago. And upon hearing that I was doing that, a mutual friend of ours, uh, who um, my family and I met originally in Vancouver. She was from Minnesota and, uh, originally, and she contacted me and said, you need to meet David Friedman. So I reached out uh, to David uh, because of some sort of baseball connection. And it turns out that David has quite that baseball connection. Um, instead of me explaining what that is, why don't we just take a few moments, David, can you tell us about your, the baseball part of your life? Well, as a kid, uh, I fell in love with baseball. I don't know, at age six or seven, I couldn't get enough of it. My summers were pretty much spent uh, following the ball. <laughs> we played every day with my friends. And uh, as a, as a grown-up, as an adult, I began to get involved back in baseball coaching. As my sons were growing up, I coached them both and then uh, had the opportunity to coach both high school and then NCAA baseball at the Division III level, which I did in 2007 and 8, uh, while on sabbatical in the U.S. Coached uh, as a coach on four of Israel's national baseball teams. I was involved in the beginning of baseball here in Israel. And I ended up being an international scout for eight years for this Baseball Cincinnati Reds, which was uh, a wonderful gig, uh, very part-time, but took me to some corners uh, in the world I never thought I'd get to. <laughs> so yeah, actually, I, when I learned that, I looked it up, and there's uh, probably people could still find it. There's a Jerusalem Post article about your trip to Uganda scouting right. baseball players for the Cincinnati Reds. Right. That was uh, an amazing experience. Yeah, and a lot of people, including Israelis, get surprised when we connect baseball with Israel at all. Mm. Yeah, yes. so I know that there's a couple of baseball fields in the country. Um, I think there's one that's an actual baseball field. Others are soccer fields that have been fixed up. There's another one being built, I think. Uh, it's been about a five or six year long project so far. <laughs> it's not done yet. But uh, yes, uh, so there are those fields. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like my sons did, they grew up playing here in Israel on soccer fields that we could rent. Right. I was, I was so surprised. Uh myself to see that there was any baseball at all in Israel and that it was such a delight to then meet you and find out that uh, you were involved in these early beginnings uh, mm -hmm. with with the sport there and I know the 
it's the Israel Baseball Federation, whatever it is, there's a motto that says where uh, traditions meet. And you, for those of you, if you know, you need to know about both Israel and baseball to understand uh, the meaning of, of, of such a statement. And so maybe this is a subject we'll come back uh, some other time, but now let's, why don't we get into the subject at hand where you've graciously uh, d accepted my invitation to come on and talk about Israel in the Middle East. And as we mentioned before we started, you know, you could, you know, take us wherever you want to take us, David, to help sure. our viewers and listeners make sense out of what's going on, give as much historical background that you think is necessary. I know it could actually take hours to do, but as briefly as possible, you know, try to give us context and help us to understand what in the world has been going on there. Okay, well, maybe what I'd like to focus on is what's going on here right now, since uh, people listen to the news and I don't know how much uh, and how good of sources that you can get in the West these days, but uh, all of you know that in the past month, Israel has been through pretty much what constituted a war. I guess wherever you have two people shooting at, you, at each other, you have a war. We had over 4,000 rockets launched at the Western Negev towns at, at the cities in the central area of Israel with a couple of attempts uh, at Northern cities. Um, and this is a, an, an ongoing situation in Israel. It never really stops. There are times when it gets worse than others on our western border with the Gaza Strip and the Hamas organization there, which is a terrorist organization that has an ironclad rule over that area. If you look at Hamas's charter, which was written in 1988, you'll see it's written in there basically that Hamas wants to see Jewish people out of Israel and all of us basically die. So they're not going to be a, an entity that you can negotiate with or really ever have any peace with. Unfortunately, I think in, in the past month, they have really flexed their muscles amongst the Arab population in Israel. So in other words, during the rocketing war, Hamas knew it wasn't going to beat Israel militarily with the rockets. It wasn't going to stop Israel from existing. It just spread a little terror for a while. They suffered an incredible... Uh, damage to their infrastructure, Hamas did. However, they had a kind of a victory, which was that they got the respect of the Arab street. And uh, as you know, the Palestinian Authority, which runs pretty much affairs for Palestinians, um, is headed by someone named Mahmoud Abbas, a former terrorist himself with the PLO. And Abbas right now is not very popular. Hamas is trying to wrest, as it were, the power in the Palestinian Authority from him, even though Hamas really is the larger of the two wings that make up the Palestinian Authority. And so I think they've made progress, Hamas has, in doing that in the past month by causing this war and in basically trying to tell Palestinians that Hamas represents them and, and not the Fatah wing of the Palestinian Authority, which is Abbas, the wing that he heads up. So I, I wondered, David, on. could could you explain yes. a little bit? Um, there's the territories. There's the uh, that it's uh, overseen, ruled by Palestinians, and you mentioned about Fatah, and and then there's Hamas. Uh, but then there's the Arab peoples living in Israel proper, and right. I wonder, can you explain that a little bit uh, for us? Like, what's sure. the difference, and and what are the implications of of some of this? Absolutely. So there's basically, um, uh, it's really a strange phenomenon, but we have Arabs who are not citizens of the state of Israel, but would consider themselves uh, subjects of the Palestinian Authority who live outside of the state of Israel. And actually right on our borders, many of them work in Israel. In fact, in our town, we have over 400 such Palestinians from villages. And what's defined as the Palestinian Authority area, so they're not Israeli citizens, who work in our town. So there's a difference between those uh, Palestinians and people who are Israeli Arabs. Sometimes they call themselves Palestinians too. But an Israeli Arab has citizenship in the state of Israel and will typically be from somewhere like Jerusalem or Haifa or Akko which are, or Jaffa, which are areas that have a large Arab uh, population to them. Uh, if you're an Arab Israeli, so you have citizenship in Israel, you're able to vote in Israel, you are uh, able to get health care here, 
the same services that I get. Um, you can go to hospitals in Israel, your educational system is in Israel, and uh, you can worship freely in Israel. So uh, the lives are quite different between Palestinians living in the Pia areas and Arab Israeli citizens. And this is, uh, so what happens is that the Palestinian Authority runs the areas that are called the Palestinian Authority areas, obviously. So in other words, they're the government per se for the Arabs who call themselves Palestinians who live outside of the borders of the state of Israel. The government so for- This is something I, I wasn't even clear on it. Uh, so there are, you're saying there are Arab people who live in Israel proper yes that may not even be the best term but um so not in the territories which we yes. often call the west bank and the gaza strip right. there are, so there are arabs living in in israel who see themselves as being under the palestinian authority i wouldn't say under the palestinian authority in fact they wouldn't want to be because the government's much better in israel as far as uh, giving them opportunity to live a productive life. No, um, what it is is the Palestinians who live outside the borders of Israel, uh, who are, are under the Palestinian Authority, have to look to the Palestinian Authority to provide for them as the government would. Right. Whereas Israeli Arabs would look to Israel's government to provide for them as a typical government would. And their citizenship is Israeli, whereas the Palestinian, his citizenship is is kind of up in the air at this point. Uh, they do have Palestinian uh, identity cards. Some of them even carry Israeli identity cards. I don't know how. Others have Jordanian ones, but they don't live in Jordan. So it's a very complicated okay. situation. Now, what yeah. you did say, though, one of the differences that happened over this most recent conflict is how ha Hamas somehow has uh, connected more with Arabs living in Israel. Yes. So can you explain that a little further? Aware. Yes. Uh, you, all of you may be aware that during the time of the rocketing war, uh, short of those two weeks, there was some widespread rioting in the cities of Jaffa and, of course, in Jerusalem and in Ramla. Uh, and these are three areas that have a good size Israeli Arab population. They were listening to Hamas is what I call provocation. And a lot of the youths, especially from the millennial generation, kind of ate up what Hamas was telling them, took to the streets. And we have a, a lot, we had a lot of riots and violence. We had five synagogues burn. And, and that's and that's all new. That that kind of phenomenon was on that scale. It's never happened before. I can't I can't recall a time yeah. in my forty years here where that's happened. No. Now, now you mentioned right at the beginning uh, something. To, along the lines of you live with this all the time but so can, can are you able to explain what it's like to live with the ongoing tension and how that's different from what happened last month sure ongoing tension is something that is present here every single day even when things are good you know i have a feeling that if israeli citizens and Arab citizens inside Israel, even Palestinians outside of our borders, didn't have the kind of government situation that we have in politics that we have, that we could live together. I really do. However, that's not what is afforded here. The PA is teaching their children to hate Jews. Hamas obviously is, is the ruling wing of the PA is taking part in that and even going above and beyond what Fatah does. So there's always this teaching going on amongst the Arab population that we don't, Israelis don't, Jews don't belong in the land of Israel. And that's underlying all the time. You don't know how many Arab citizens of Israel believe that. You don't know how many Palestinians believe that. You don't know how it affects them. Um, you know, and obviously you don't go around asking. So that tension is always there. We had a young man in our uh, synagogue who came to some of us older people in the synagogue one day in tears. And he said, you know, every time I get on a bus, every Arab and Arabs can use their bus system with no problem. We have Arab bus drivers, in fact. And uh, every Arab he passed on the bus, he said, would just stare at me with hatred and he said i don't know what to do i don't hate arabs and i i want to live at peace i don't want to get on a bus and feel like there's daggers coming at me all the time so there's he was just picking up 
the tension that there is. Now, would you, would, I, you know, I don't. Would you say that animosity from Arabs towards Jews is? How prevalent is that from your experience? You know, I should have asked you right at the beginning, how long have you been living in Israel? 40 years. Okay, so that's a, that's a good biblical number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, so you're quite experienced. Um, so how much goodwill or lack thereof is there between Arabs and Jews generally? And is it, is it a matter of like, diff depends where you live? Or is that young man's experience just the way it is? I think there are areas that are better than others. And I think there are also um, some Arab families that are more inclined to be, be able to live side by side with Jews than others. And I also think that it just depends on, yeah, what, what the climate's like at the moment. So in other words, a lot of those Arab youths who were riding a month ago, probably are settled back down in the regular life now and don't go around stabbing Jews every day. It's just they got, it, it was Ramadan, passions were stoked. There were a couple of situations in the politics here that were unresolved between Jews and Arabs here in the, in the land of Israel that just gave way to what was going on. Again, Alan, I, you know, I think that most Arab families that I know, that I meet, would be happy, to, who live in Israel, are happy to live in Israel at peace with Jews. What gets happened is we have these times of uh, when provocation takes place. We have sensitive times of the year. We have things happening on the Temple Mount. And when there's a problem on the Temple Mount, passions just get inflamed. And there's there's no reasoning with these, the, these kinds of emotions. You can't reason with, with a mob, so to speak. So that happens. and. Um, it happens on just a regular kind of cycle. You can almost predict when it's going to happen. There are declared days of rage by the Palestinian Authority where they encourage people to take to the streets and throw rocks at Jewish cars and burn tires in their Arab villages. And, uh, you know, they, they announce the date ahead of time. So on those days, you're going to expect problems. But generally speaking, uh, I'm more optimistic, I guess. I think if there wasn't that kind of provocation, and if the educational system and the Palestinian Authority would teach tolerance, I think uh, the great majority of Arab citizens would be happy to live at peace with their Jewish neighbors. In fact, on a daily basis, when I walk in Jerusalem, that's what I see. I see Arab families going uh, out in their shopping malls, strolling with their babies with Jewish families, and there's no animosity that you see between people. You have Arab waiters and waitresses serving Jews and vice versa. In our hospitals, I had an Arab doctor do a procedure on me with his Jewish nurse a few years back. There's no animosity. Uh, but then we hit times when uh, simply it just all seems to come to a head. Yeah, this and is something that, are, this yeah, is one of the reasons why I like to bring people to Israel, for them to actually see what it's like. I know for myself, I've only been there three times. I hope that number goes up. Uh, but um, the I would be struck by how normal life was because we're so affected by the media lens on the situation that when you actually right. get there, um, and whether it's, well, all the various interactions and, uh, and the restaurants and the kids going to school and the kids playing. And it's like, wait a second, this looks like, you know, like, the good part of North American life, like what's going on here? It's supposed to be disaster all the time. Now, then it you do get be. reminded. You know, I've been, I've been to. Um, um, is it Safad? What's is that? Is that the right name? You know, where the where the bus shelters are are also bomb shelters because they're very close yeah. to Gaza. Right. And so, on one hand, it's normal. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's this sense of of always having to be ready for the next thing. And my heart goes out to 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 you that you have to live with that kind of tension all the time. It's definitely there. And uh, Israelis, uh, for the most part, are always aware of our surroundings. So you'll find uh, this is kind of a funny phenomenon. But uh, I find myself when I go into a restaurant, I always want to sit in the back corner where I can look and see who's coming in. That's very much a security kind of thing that's just been drilled into me. <laughs> so when I go to the States, People say, you want to sit here? And I said, no, no, I want to sit there. 
facing the doorway. <laughs> Not that he could do anything. Um, yeah, that tension is there. Uh, and I think, especially as, uh, as a Messianic Jew, I, I don't want to hate people who hate me. But on the same hand, living here so long, I do realize that you have to stand up for your right to live in your nation. And if you don't do that, there are people who would be very happy to revoke that violently for me. My son lives uh, in Jerusalem. Oh, five, six blocks away from him is an Arab village. He can't walk in there. His family can't walk in there. They won't come out alive. So you have to know which particular Arab towns are not friendly to Jews and which are, and there are differences. Arab Christian villages tend to be much friendlier. And there are Bedouin uh, encampments and Bedouin villages generally are, are you know, are, are okay. Uh, and but, but if Muslim villages, you just have to know which ones are high security and which ones are not a security risk. Yeah, so this, this complex version of what's really going on there and what it's like to live there. This is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm doing this podcast, thinking biblically, because a, a biblical, in my understanding, a biblical understanding of life is to reckon with its complexities, its nuances, its ambiguities. And not only the media, but now people, everything's been reduced to this, this kind of, I call it a soundbite culture. And you cannot talk about these truths, these realities in sound bites. It's absolutely impossible. Uh, trying to do it then skews what the reality really is. Yeah. So you know, even in a in a our conversation, you know, how much can we actually cover? But I did want to ask, is in your opinion, and you've you're involved to some extent in the in the political realm in Israel, is there anything in your opinion that Israel could do uh, apart from, you know, who's right, who's wrong, and all the rest, um, what I've been seeing is more and more, everyone wants to put the responsibility all on Israel, um, and then, you know, my reaction is to kind of push back from that, but is there anything that Israel could be doing that could help make the situation better? Do you mean as far as our relationship with the rest of the world or with the Arab population around us, or both? <laughs> well, yeah, primarily the the situation on the ground in Israel. Okay. You, you know, you yourself have said there could, you know, you hope for peace and, and yeah. right? So how? Uh, I sometimes throw my hands up at that question, Alan. I don't know. I mean, obviously Israel can uh, be more compassionate as a people, but we really do try. I see attempts at that, like the Save a Child's Heart program, which is- Why really don't you explain that? A lot of people aren't aware of what that is. That's just one program out of many. In that particular program, there is really doctors. Uh, Ami Cohen, who was involved in Israeli baseball's founding, uh, was one of them. He founded this organization. And what they do is they treat uh, Palestinian and Arab, uh, along with other Middle Eastern nations and African nations, pediatric cardiac patients. So they take children, doesn't matter what their background is. They don't charge them a penny. They do whatever cardiac operation that the child can't get in his own country for free in Israel. The child is hospitalized for free, treated for free, recovered for free here, and then is sent home after. And of course, his family is hosted by that hospital and its staff of doctors while the child's here. There have been over 1,000 Palestinian cardiac patients treated by that program alone. So why, why, would, why, would, but why would Israel do that? Like why? There's a lot of compassion here. There really is. And I, uh, it's an impressive thing to see our people having gone through the show on that long ago. The Which is, the, for those who don't, the show is the Hebrew word for the Holocaust. Yeah, the Holocaust. And having four declared wars and then this tension continually going on with continual terror attacks and continual shedding of blood of some sort. Still, there is uh, there are so many Israelis who want to do good in this world and want to give good to those who, who are in need of it, no matter what their ethnic background is. Did you know that Israel was the first nation in the world to take in Bosnian refugees during the conflict there? I don't know if it was 30 some years ago. So and I've heard of, I don't know if I was aware of that one. I know it was, it, uh, 
Israel was the first to be on the ground in Haiti after the Haitian uh, earthquake. Is Israel's done these remarkable things. Yeah, we have, and that impresses me. And I want to, I, I want to believe that that represents the heart and soul of our people. Now, can we do things better? Well, of course we can. There's always opportunities to have better relations than we do. But honestly, for what we're going through as a people and as a nation, uh, you know, my hat goes off to this nation. It's really uh, been a shining example in many ways of typical of behavior that you just won't see. I, I mean, one of the things I like to do is build a scenario for people, what it's like living here with where they live. I'll do that for you in just a second here. It'll take a minute, but it's worth it. And, and I said to myself, no other nation in the world would act the way Israel does. For example, with what's going on in the Gaza Strip, you live in Ontario. I'm going to bring you to Detroit, Michigan, and Windsor, Ontario. Let's say Ontario and the state of Michigan are having a war. And across the bay there is shelling and rockets and bombing and shooting. And the entire port authority of both cities has to close down. Now, if you're living in Windsor, what would it be like for you? If the media in Detroit talks about how at the first opportunity they're going to march into Windsor and cut all your heads off and, you know, rape your daughters and wives and burn down your town and they're serious about it. And uh, if you're not defending yourself, that is what's going to happen because you can see in Detroit there's this huge military buildup of, of military there and they're shooting artillery across the bay, et cetera, et cetera. What if that happened at least once a year for a 10 day period, the shooting across the bay, but the media assault was constant? And what if there were people from Michigan coming into Windsor all the time and going all the way to London, Ontario, trying to carry out terror attacks? That is what <clears throat> it's like living here. That kind of thing is yeah. happening all the time. And, and, and I so, think that, that's part of the narrative that a lot of people outside of Israel don't really understand. And, and so I was just watching a, uh, just yesterday, getting a little prepared for our time, um, a, a video by the Wall Street Journal about some of the destruction that happened over the rocket attacks was posted there. And mm -hmm. it fed the narrative that, um, yes, Hamas was sending indiscriminate rockets towards civilian areas, and it did cause some damage. Um, but look what Israel did in, in, in attacking these high-rise buildings and all this destruction, the people died. And um, you know, when Israel first started as a nation in 1948, it, it was a David and Goliath story, and uh, Israel was the David. But it wasn't now Israel's the, seen as the Goliath that is just flexing its muscle. You know, these, these poor, oppressed um, Palestinian people are frustrated, and so they're acting out in, in, in trying to do whatever they can to get the world's attention and all the rest. And then big, powerful Israel comes in and just bashes them to pieces. And so then all the responsibility is put on Israel for being so, you know, oppressive upon the, but the, uh, upon the Arabs. But what you've just said is giving the, the why Israel has to take such a strong stand because um, the, the people attacking Israel actually want to do far more than just indiscriminately send rockets. Read the Hamas charter. They want to commit genocide here. They're, they're sworn to it. Here's a lot of people, I, I don't think they're willing to accept that they, that they mean what they're saying. Well, that, you know, uh, yeah. when Hamas was born in 1987, I, I happened to be in the army on the Gaza Strip, and I got to see with my own eyes Hamas operatives holding, I don't know, I'm going to guess a year old, year old children in front of them as they were attacking the police at that time with rocks and bricks and knives and even zip guns. Uh, I mean, what kind of person does that? That is child abuse. And it really shows the intent of Hamas. They don't care who gets hurt. They have their political aims and come hell or high water, they're going to achieve them is what they're trying to portray. Here's another fact. If Israel was really targeting civilians, then we're the worst military ever in the history of the world. Because I'm sorry about the fact that 260 civilians in Gaza died, but when there's millions of people there, and if we were targeting civilians and that's your toll, 
That's pretty bad <laughs> if you get what I'm saying. I think that's we that's were, really hard for for the average, you know, media consumer to actually get that because it's all they could see is the tragedy of the over 200 civilians. But that actually makes a lot of sense what you're saying. If Israel actually did want to do what people are saying they want to do, you know, right. it could have been a, a, would have been a lot worse. So how how do you answer this this charge of Israel's an apartheid state? What what do you say? That's absolutely ridiculous. And uh, let me tell you that I have a friend in, in South Africa who laughs and laughs when he hears that. He's older than me. He grew up in apartheid South Africa, and he's visited Israel. But Desmond he Tutu voted, himself, Desmond Tutu himself, has said that. I know he did. Yeah, but this uh, young man. Um, not so young, but he wrote the introduction to my book, uh, Will the Nazi Eagle Rise Again? That's another book I wrote. And uh, he, in his introduction, which is about a, a page or so long, he, he takes apart the idea that Israel's an apartheid state. As a black South African, he would know. Okay, here's what I say, Alan. In South Africa, in the Union of South Africa apartheid, Blacks and whites couldn't socialize. In Israel, as you've seen with your own eyes, is Israelis and Arabs are socializing. Uh, secondly, uh, Arabs uh, take part in regular life in Israel. Arabs can, as I say, a good number of doctors and nurses in our hospitals are Arabs, uh, and they they you know are hospitalized and are treated in our hospitals that didn't take place in the union of south africa union of south africa white people black people could not use the beach together they were segregated in israel our beaches are not segregated in our professional soccer league uh we have a number of teams that have arabs playing in them we even have an arab team from the town of saknin in the republic of south africa none of that took place there was no athletic competition between black south africans and white Wait, south so africans you're so you're making it sound like it's a nonsense claim oh then, absolutely then why do they why is anybody saying this because emotions connect up to that image it's an image a false image as my south african friend luba says it's a false image kenneth misho the parliament member in today's uh, Republic of South Africa, a black member will say the same thing. This is absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and it's done in order to catch the emotion, especially of young adults, because young adults, I don't wanna come down on young adults. I'm a father of a couple of them, <laughs> but young adults often don't check out the background of what they're told. They're told something, it strikes an emotional chord, it must be true, and therefore those Jews are, are you know, have an apartheid state. We do not. You wanna see an apartheid yeah. state? Go to neighboring Saudi Arabia. There you'll see one. You want to see another apartheid state? Go to neighboring Jordan. You'll see one. There's not one Jew who lives in either of those two countries. We're banned from doing so. What do you call that? But nobody will say a thing about that. Right, right. Um, with the, some of the time we have remaining, or all the time we have remaining, can you share with us, uh, explain uh, to us outside the land uh, what's just happened politically with there was all these elections one after the other yeah. and finally there's been a changing of the guard so to speak can you yeah sure. unpack well, that for as, us? Uh, everyone knows we just had elections for i guess the third time in the past uh, two years uh i by the way was a candidate in those elections i didn't win <laughs> but anyhow naftali bennett uh was elected as our prime minister. Well, I can't even say he was elected as our prime minister. He became prime minister through the working of the coalition system. We're after the British parliamentary system and the way they, that uh, elections operate. So you're voting for a party. Uh, Bennett's party did not get the majority of mandates uh, that there are. But when uh, basically Bibi Netanyahu was our prime minister for 12 straight years, his and fractured and then in the negotiations that took place afterwards between the people who the media would call on the right side of politics they came together and they got some coalition members to join them from the left side of israeli politics namely Yair lapid and then even a, a pro-muslim brotherhood uh party head uh, by the name of Mansour Abbas, who had uh, who brought some mandates with him from Arab votes, and those three got together and were able to get enough people to back them, 
And of course, Bennett was going to be the prime minister in that scenario with Lapid scheduled in another two years, I think, to, to have a rotation of the prime minister, which you can do by Israeli law. So we're going to have Bennett for two years, Lapid for a little under two years afterwards before the next elections. So this, this is, is very, strange. this whole system is very foreign. So in Canada here, we also have the British parliamentary system. Um, right. And we vote for a party, and then the the head of that party, the that gets uh, most votes. If the party gets most votes, then the that's the prime minister, the head of that party. But Israel, you've got this uh, uh, system that many Canadians thought we should switch to, which is proportional representation. Right, and it a- and it results in this uh, uh, plethora of parties and all sorts of parties getting all sorts of votes. And you've never had in your history a true majority government where one party by itself ever got a majority of votes. Isn't that correct? We did once. Uh, and I think 1996, I believe it was, we had a direct president, uh, a direct prime ministerial election. Uh, Netanyahu ran against uh, oh, Perez. And, like and the American and system. Yes. And that's how you got the prime minister. But in terms of the the governing house, the legislature in Israel called the Knesset, we call it the parliament here in Canada, um, you've never had a party that had 50% plus one of the vote ever. No. Right. So so like a a party that's gotten a lot of the vote, it's always been like 35%. And that, that would be a really good showing. And then what happens is they start to court other parties to build a coalition, they wheel and deal oh, together. Correct. Yeah. Right. And so you end up with a very kind of interesting collection of interests in the in yeah. the in the government. Yeah. Correct. Definitely, you do. And it's- it was around that point that David's internet connection completely cut out, and so it took us a couple of minutes to get reconnected, and then we picked up the conversation where it left off. And David's using a different device at this point. Well, anyhow, what I was saying was that uh, it's very difficult to get much done with the new government that we have. And I think everybody is a little bit concerned about that because, you know, we need to pass a budget to get the government operating with any of our social services like healthcare and education. The problem being that there are so many interests represented by so many different parties and some of those contradict each other. Like, I really don't know how the security situation is going to be discussed and acted upon in terms of budget and whatever with a pro-Muslim Brotherhood party in the mix with a pretty large voice. Uh, it'll be interesting to see because they are not particularly big on spending money on securing their state for some reason. <laughs> so we have that to, to work through. I think Bennett is going to have to gain the confidence of the Israeli people because like you said, it wasn't a, a majority kind of election that produced him, but finagling with the coalition uh, parties that did. Um, so it's going to take time for them to get off the ground, to get to know each other, to figure out who's going to run what ministry in what way. If you take a look at the ministers that have been appointed now to uh, take charge of various arms of the government, uh, it's really going to be interesting to see because, again, we have a lot of different parties represented, a lot of different sympathies represented there. Just for an example of one that's really important to us, the Messianic Jewish community in Israel is who controls the immigration authority. And uh, it, it was in the hands of the Shas party, which hated us and didn't do anything to help immigrants who might be uh, under our umbrella, so to speak. And the, the, Shas, the Shas party, the, the, uh, they are uh, what we call ultra-Orthodox or the Haredi, correct? They're Sephardic, Sephardic uh, Orthodox, yes. Okay, not al- so um, ultra-Orthodox wouldn't be the right term? No, no. Oh, okay. Sephardic Orthodox would be. And um, but, but very, very new- antagonistic towards Jewish believers. In Yeshua. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And so, and so is and there... Toward, oh, well, go ahead. actually, they're pretty antagonistic toward anybody who doesn't think the way they do. And that okay. would include us. We're not the only ones. They, they, right. they don't, that's they're the, not that's an important point. And it is with a lot of uh, 
kind of partisan politics that we have here. Uh, actually, parties are fairly closed in terms of their tolerance of other parties. So it takes a lot of work to build relationship here within political within the political structure and for people to work together. It really does. Can it can this coalition last or are you going to go into another election really soon? What do you think? Well, that's the question. My opinion, it can last if Bennett begins to gain the confidence of other politicians as well as his party. And that's the question, if he'll be able to do that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I hope it does. I, even though, obviously, our party ran against Bennett, um, I, I, another election costs so much money and time and energy, and it would have to there'd have to be a large scale failure for the government to operate well in order to bring about another government. And that's just not good for the country or people. So I do hope that they can. Are you concerned for this? Are you concerned about the state of security because of this current government? It's not the government per se. I'll tell you what my concern is. You mentioned David and Goliath before. Let's take a look at reality. Israel, a nation of 9 million people, 7 million of us are Jewish, are surrounded by over 350 million people whose governments believe we don't have a right to exist as a free and independent Jewish state. Now that's David and Goliath right there. You do have nations. I'm, I'm like going to stop. I, I need to stop you right there. And I, okay. I hope this doesn't take us down a, you know, because this could take time. Didn't Israel just sign some peace ag agreements with some of those countries? With the United Arab Emirates, yes, and with Bahrain, yes, and with the Sudan. But uh, if you take their populations off that 350 million, it, it doesn't it doesn't dent it very much. So it's you're but saying have it's a drop. In, these are drops in the bucket in terms of the population. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, but in terms of government power, I mean, you have the state of Iran, which is an Arab. Uh, it's Iranian, but. Uh, you have the state of Iran pledge to destroy our state. And if they get nuclear weapons, which they're advancing towards very quickly, uh, I have no doubt they'll try to use them against us if they can. And so uh, it, given that situation, Iran has, what, 70 some million people, if not more. We really end up being the David. 150,000 rockets in southern Lebanon are aimed at Israel. 150,000. We just took a barrage of 4,000. And it caused a lot of chaos. 150,000 that Iran, uh, Iran's proxy army, Hezbollah, put there, and they're being trained and helped by Iran and Russia to operate them. And so that again adds to the David and Goliath kind of thing that uh, goes through my mind because Israel really is the David. I mean, it's kind of a vile way to use that image, using it against this Roman claim network a lot, given the historical roots of the story. But anyhow, uh, that's the reality. And it, it does make me concerned. I mean, Alan, my, my grandchildren are growing up in, 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 this, in the Middle East that's increasingly intolerant toward Israel. And so what is their future going to look like? Okay, granted, I, I, I think the, the Bible, the Torah paints a picture of things in the end that are going to, you know, Israel is never going to fall per se as a people. But, you know, the constant bleeding that goes on, the constant tension that we're under, I don't see that necessarily getting better at all. Unless, because we have a big situation in our hands with Iran and with Hezbollah and those 150,000 rockets and with Hamas on our Western border. Uh, we're going to have to find uh, a solution and a conclusion to those three situations. And then you have uh, the Soviets. Oops, I'm sorry, that was a Freudian slip. Uh, you have the Russians under President Putin, just, what, 70 kilometers from our border with their military. So to quote a neighbor of mine, the future doesn't always look that rosy in terms of natural things. Is, is there anything that we who live outside the land uh, and the region can be doing? Well, certainly those who are, uh, are Christians and are believers can pray for the state of Israel. We certainly need that. And the entire state of Israel, all Jews included, welcome the prayers of the Christian world for our protection. 
that would be one. Secondly, talking to your neighbors if if they're interested in what's going on in the Middle East can really open their eyes because I'm sure they're not being, I'm sure they're not able to get uh, the other side of the story per se because the media has become so biased, I think. By the way, I used to work in the Army Spokesman's Unit, so I'm familiar with how the media can take things and twist them in a way that doesn't necessarily uh, give a good, uh, a good, a uh, good, uh, uh, I was going to say an accurate picture of what really is going on. So uh, let, um, let, this, let this be my last question then. Can you recommend any good sources of information that, that people could absolutely. help themselves to and, and share with others? Yes, the camera website, just camera, is a really good site that uh, does great uh, uh, essays, etc. for people. There's another one called Memory, M-E-M-R-I. Okay, so is camera uh, spelled camera? Yes, camera I'll look it up and I'll, I'll put the link in the in the description. Sure. Memory, M-E-M-R-I is a really good one. Um, the Palestinian Media Watch, or PMW, is another great website. Even the Jerusalem Post website, if you're going to read the Israeli press, the Jerusalem Post for English readers. Uh, it's very loud now. Yeah, I know. My wife is commenting that the, the new editor of it is rather uh, a departure from what the Post used to be. But generally speaking, I think they, they cover events as they really do happen. And if you don't get too caught up in their new uh, editor's editorials. <laughs> so okay. those sites are okay. good ones. So Joel um, Rosenberg started this All Israel News. Have you checked that out? I would have. And uh, Joel also would be a recommended source. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'll put that in as well. A any others? Absolutely. No. So any others? Oh, those are the ones that come to mind right okay. now. Okay. That's great. So, like I said, I'll share those in the description, and um, I really right. appreciate. By the way, the IDF has a. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh no, no. If you did, take it away. <laughs> oh, okay. The IDF, the Israel Defense Forces website, is actually actually very good at explaining things as well. So, but didn't you just uh, so say that you can't? That. I thought you said you can't necessarily trust what comes out. Like, did I get confused? You said you were involved as an army, the spokesman thing a moment ago. Oh, I wasn't talking about uh, uh, Israel's media. I'm talking about the foreign media here. So, in other words, oh. one of my jobs uh, when I was in the military was to pass on information of what was going on here to, say, an Italian journalist. And uh, sometimes when you look and see at the coverage you got from uh, the information that you shared with them, uh, it didn't come off the way I would have written the article. Oh, oh okay, way. okay. So I'm talking so, about foreign journalists. Oh, all well. right. Yeah, so, yeah, there's the IDF website, um, their Facebook page, uh, Instagram. I've been really impressed yeah. with some of their posts. Um, it's. I would imagine sure. for people who have already been convinced of what the the mainstream media is saying they would they would view some of the positive posts as a form of propaganda um, but we can encourage people do your own research you know, get to the bottom of these stories exactly yeah and please folks i think that's it, really good Alan. Yeah, yep. yeah and folks if you have any questions for david um we talked earlier send them to me and i'll pass them on to him um we the purpose of this of this podcast and know oh, david's heart is the same i hope you were able to hear it that we want we want to portray the truth and there really is a truth that we could get to and we want to see god's blessing on all peoples uh, in israel and the region the whole middle yeah. east uh we want to see true justice and, and true equity fairness for all people and there are so many people Absolutely. that are, are working towards these things and this is what we want to encourage so david thank you so much yes. for for being with hopefully. me and hopefully we could do this again sometime soon um and so everyone uh as i mentioned if you have any questions or comments for david uh we talked earlier you could send them to me you could send them to comments at torabytes.org comments at torabytes.org that'll also be in the description send your your questions your comments to me and i'll pass them on 
to David. Uh, we will come back to this topic, whether with David's help or somebody else in the weeks ahead. But next week, I'm so looking forward to Dr. Rod Wilson being with us. Uh, he is the former president of Regent College in Vancouver and longtime psychologist, and he is going to be talking about, or we're going to be discussing the topic of anger, which I've called uh, the, mis the most misunderstood emotion. And I'll ask Rod if he agrees with me or not, and we'll take it from there. So you don't want to miss that. Each week we're going to be doing this uh, Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And of course, it's on YouTube. And you can always see it after. So uh, it'd be great to hear from you. I've really appreciated the comments I've already received from our first episode. Looking forward to seeing what you have to say about this one. And so until next time, this is Alan Gilman for Thinking Biblically.